So this week we are getting into decisions. And it is really where we're first stepping into how to make an algorithm in a computer program. We're going to have to teach our computer what it is we need it to do from a question and answer standpoint. Up until now, we've just input, well not just, we have input things and output things and done some calculations. But we haven't had the computer make any decisions for us. So this week, that's what we are doing. And for some people, especially people who are new to programming, this is a paradigm shift because we're used to asking questions to people and getting answers. But you can't Neymar. ask questions to the computer the way you would ask them to a person um, because computers are stupid. And I'll explain more about that in a minute. So... Um, Let's do a bit of background. Understanding how to program Python to make a decision is your first part in writing an algorithm. An algorithm is simply a set of procedures for solving some form of computational problem. Think the game in week seven. That is a computational problem. You will have a couple of algorithms that you have written. We are, everything we do from here to the rest of the class is either about writing algorithms or structuring the data to use that so that the algorithms can use it. So this week we're talking about decisions and branching. We're going to ask questions to the computer and based on the data that the computer has at that moment, it's going to give us an answer. Next week we're going to loop. We're going to learn how to make the same decision repeatedly given different data. Um, five is functions. We're going to take all this stuff that we've done, all the lines of code. We can, excuse me, write an algorithm and name it. And that's very powerful. Module six is data structures. Data structures are how do we, how do we deal with collections of data? And how does that fit in to the overall, um, to the overall way in which we program because what we do in programming is what they call data-driven programming. So the data structures are very important in that. Seven is data storage, files. We're going to read and write files and eight is object-oriented which teaches us a different way to structure. Three, four, five, and six are going to be used in your game. So it's important that you understand what's going on, and we will work through these lectures um, to kind of get an understanding of what we need for the game while we're going through each of these modules. So there is the module, and then there's the end game of the game. So we have some new keywords. And in this case, keywords actually have an order. So, order one is the if, the keyword if. And the keyword if tells Python that you're about to ask it to make a decision. Two through n, however many n is, I have written if else statements when I wrote a programming language that I think it was about 110 if else statements. And this tells Python that you're going to make another decision, but it going to be related to the first one and we'll explain how about that in a bit but those two are related the last thing in the order is the word else and else is related to if and it's related to elif if there are elifs because there doesn't have to be and um, what to do when all else fails that's what else means, really, when all else fails. If you have to have the word if to ask a question that, as the first question. You don't ever have to have an elif, and you don't ever have to have an else. Those two are completely optional. However, they really do make algorithms more powerful. The fact that you can relate one question to another. 
So we have relational operators. So we've talked about arithmetic operators. These are relational operators. And what relational operators are is they help you combine, well, no, sorry, those are Boolean operators. These help you determine how to write the question. So double equal sign is, are two things equivalent? Remember when I've always said, we know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. This is why I say the words single equal sign, because there's a double equal sign that means something completely different. We also have the exclamation point and an equal, which is not equivalent to. That's what it reads as. Less than, less than or equal to, greater than, and greater than or equal to. So we also have... Yeah, we also have yeah, we also um, can everybody please mute? A Boolean operator allows us to combine questions because the questions we're going to be writing are really, really, really simple questions. So sometimes we're going to want to combine them to make a more uh, broad question or a more structured question. The Boolean operators are AND, which says, are both things true or both things false? That's what AND does. Um, it compares the output of each question, and you're anding it together. There is an or which takes the outcome of each question and says, is it true or false? Because that can change the answer. And not is the opposite. Now, you think, why in the world would I want to do not and? Sometimes you do want to, instead of writing an or, you want to write a not and because you want a definitive. And that probably didn't make any sense to anybody, but there is a good use case for the word not. So I talked about how computers are stupid. <laughs> Why in the world did I say that? We can play massively, you know, massive multiplayer games from, with people all over the world on a computer. Why in the world would I call it stupid? Because a computer can only have two states. It can have true it can have false. It's like a light switch, on and off. And I'm not even talking about a dimmer switch. It is simply a light switch. You turn it on or you turn it off. So the oh, there's only ever two possible values for any condition, for any question you ask. And that is true or false. And that's why for some people who are starting in computer science, this chapter starts to baffle people and it's because we have to change the way we think when it comes to asking a question to a computer we can't ask a subjective question we have to ask a deterministic question we have to know the data and we have to be able to give it the data and tell it make a decision based on that so there's another component here and it's called scope now, we don't really start talking about scope in Xi books until we get into functions, but I think we need to talk about it sooner. And we need to talk about it sooner because we are, in fact, creating scope when we create a decision. What is a scope? A scope is where you can actually use a variable. It's what scope does. Everything we've done so far is in the global scope. The variables that we have, have been using are available through the entire script. They, they'll have the last value you set, and that's great. Now we're introducing something called the local scope. The local scope actually says, I'm going to kind of create a little, a little black box, and I'm going to define variables in here, and those variables are not available in the global scope. If you try and use them in the global scope, you're going to get an error because it doesn't exist. And I'll show you what happens in the kind of errors that you're going to get. So scope is the fourth part to all of this. And it's the part that I don't think Zybooks does a good job right now. But understand that I'm going to be talking about global scope and local scope starting this week. I'm going to describe and tell you what is in the global scope and what is in the local scope because that is also a sticking point with students when they start to do 
branching and it's going to be looping and functions, all of this. So you need to understand the difference. And the difference is where is that variable available? Where is that piece of code going to sit when it is run? So let's talk about syntax, formatting, and scope. Here's a real quick Python um, Python script. I have user age equal int input. We've all seen that line before. I'm going to take some input. I expect it to be an integer. I'm going to assign that value to the variable user age. I know user age is a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Everything underneath that is kind of new. So first, I have my keyword if. Oh, sorry. Scope. I didn't tell you what the scope was. User age is in the global scope. Anything in blue is global scope. The if statement is in the global scope. The else statement is in the global scope. But you will notice the print statement that is underneath the if user age is less than 18 is in the local scope. And it's not left justified. That P is not under the I of the F. That's because it is tabbed in or it is indented. The same with else. Else is in the global scope. The print statement underneath that global scope, the else, is in the local scope of the else. It doesn't exist until the if statement above it, excuse me, um, evaluates to false. So anything in the local scope has to be indented at least one. And everything has to line up. This is one of those things with space delimited languages. Because Python doesn't have any other way to determine what's in the local scope and what's in the global scope. So you really do have to um, indent properly. So that's and we'll go back to this. I'll keep talking about scope through this lecture. So I have the if keyword and I have the else keyword. If tells Python it's time to make a decision. Else tells Python that it's going that it's time to make a decision. After the if statement, I have sorry, after the if keyword, I have a statement. And that statement reads user underscore age is less than 18. Now, that doesn't sound like a question. Doesn't I don't think anybody thinks that sounds like a question. It's a statement. But here's how we have to read it. We read it by saying user underscore age is less than or equal to 18, true or false. That's where the question comes in. So branching is like a true or false, quest, a true or false quiz. You only have two answers, true or false. So we read it as user underscore age is less than or 18, true or false. Now, I can't, I can't tell you true or false right now because I don't know the value of user age. And then we have the colon. The colon will become your nemesis probably. It still does when I write Python. I will sit there and be writing Python and writing Python, and then all of a sudden, I will go back and look and I will realize that I forgot colons. Whoops. I'm sorry, that shouldn't have gone. Yes. Uh, can any can everybody hear or is it just Greg? Okay. Greg, do you want to try and uh, get out of the meeting and then come back in and see if you can hear at that point? Okay. Oh, you can hear now. Okay, great, Greg. So let's go back and look at this for one more second. So not only after the if statement do you have to have a colon, after the else you have to have a colon. Um, and the rule is if it, it can only be in the local scope if it is indented. And then also a statement is a variable followed by a Boolean operator, followed by a variable or a value. And I'm going to talk about the left-hand side and the right-hand side. 
Um, we are on module three. So if I'm talking about what's on the left-hand side, in this case, user age is on the left-hand side of the um, less than sign, and then the value 18, the number 18, is on the right-hand side. So, and I'm going to be going back and forth more tonight than I have been in the last couple. Uh, so here's PyCharm. This is 3.22. And we're just going to do some debugging. So I have my debugger. I have my breakpoint set here at line 11. We've done this before. I'm going to edit my configuration. I'm going to go into 3.22. Uh, which one? 3.22. So when I debug this, I'm not going to de stop on line 4. I'm stopping on line 11. So I'm starting, and my console, I'm going to put in the number 42. So now I'm on line 11. I have user age is 42. I can go over to my variables. I can see that the value of user age is 42. So I am now on line 11, and what Python is about to do is answer my question. User age is less than or equal to 18, true or false? Well, given that user age has the value of 42, and I'm testing it against the value 18, 42, it, 42 is less than or equal to 18 is a false statement. So what's going to happen with that is I'm going to go, I'm not going to ex execute lines 12 or 13 because for Python, when this statement evaluates to false, these lines don't exist. They will never, ever, ever be run. The only way that lines 12 and 13 ever get executed is if line 11 evaluates to true. So what will happen? Well, what's going to happen is I'm going to jump down to 15. Now, I didn't stop and make any other decisions on line 14. Line 14, because it's an else statement, says if all of the other if-else statements that I'm related to have failed, have, have evaluated defaults, then do what's in my local scope. So line 15 is in the local scope of the else block. So I'm going to step over, and it's going to print over 18. So now I'm going to debug it again, and this time I'm going to put 10 in. So user age is now 42. So the interesting thing here is that simply by changing that value, my program is going to act differently because user age is 10. 10 is less than or equal to 18, true or false. This time it evaluates to true. Given that it evaluates to true, Python is going to say, okay, I now have to execute what is inside the local scope of this if statement. So it's going to go to line 12, and it's going to print 18 or less. Let's go to the console and look at that. And then it's just going to print another line because I just wanted to show that you could have multiple lines in this if statement. And then it's going to end. It never went in and printed over 18. So simply by the way I have structured my if and else statements, and I have changed the way the program runs by giving it different data. So let's keep going. Oh, let me let me let me do one more thing. I'm going to break this. I'm going to break it on purpose. So I am going to. All I did was take the line 12 and backspace it by one. So there's a tab. Everything's fine. There are no red squiggly lines. 
if I backspace this, all of a sudden I get really weird squiggly lines. Now we just saw this work, and it's about to not work. So what I'm getting here is I'm getting an indentation error. So it's telling me that on line 12, at print, I have an indentation error, unexpected, expected an indent block. That is because with Python, you have to have an indentation block if you have an if statement. It cannot exist otherwise. So Python's going to throw an exception. So that's great. I now indent it and I fix that problem. However, let's say I don't indent that one because I just forgot to hit the tab key. Now I have a different set of errors. I have else and I have print and they have the red squiggly lines. So let's run this and I have syntax error, invalid syntax at line 14. When I go and look at line 14, there's nothing wrong with that line. That line is completely syntactically correct. The problem is with the line above it. And that is because I have told Python, by the way this is structured, haven't done anything than, than delete a, a tab that this else statement shouldn't be there because I've gone from global scope, now I'm in the local scope, now I've gone back to the global scope, and then I'm going to say, okay, I have an else that's supposed to be related to this if, and it can't be because there's a global scope that interrupts that. So the only way to fix that error is to either remove line 13 or indent it properly. So, um, computers aren't smart, smart in our programming languages, and that's a very true statement. So, I just have a quick question here. Am I younger than 18? Python's like, I have no clue. How am I supposed to tell if you're younger than 18? Because Python doesn't speak English, so we're going to have to learn to speak Python. All of our questions are true-false questions. So, how do I ask a Python a question to Python? Well, I give it a variable, and I'm going to go through this kind of quick because I realized that I'd already said all this. I'm going to use that test variable against a value, and there are only two possible outcomes, true or false. And we've seen with 3.22, 3.2.2, when we were just looking at it in PyCharm, how that behaves. Okay, I'm going to either print 18 or less, which is in the local scope, or... I'm going to print over 18, which is in the local scope of the else statement. Now, if and else are related, simply by being if and else. So you have to remember that when you are writing your branches. Else cannot with, uh, exist with a, without an if. It, if you don't have an if before it, you can't have the else. And, as we saw just a minute ago, the indentation has to be proper. So, for print 18 or less, that will only get executed when user age is less than or equal to 18. Print over 18 will only get executed if user age is not less than or equal to 18. So, that is how that works. Okay, so we're going to use flowcharts this week as kind of a visual tool, but this is the last week we will be using flowcharts. We're going to be using pseudocode for the most part, and we're definitely going to be using pseudocode when it comes to talking about the labs because the um, flowcharts are just too big for the slides. So here is my quick flowchart. I have a start bubble and an end bubble. Then I have this offset rectangle. That offset rectangle, and this, by the way, the shapes are important. When you turn in your flow charts, if your shapes aren't right, it, you're going to get points taken off. So input and output are that offset rectangle. A decision is a triangle. And you'll notice with my triangle, I have true coming out of one side and false coming out of another. So if I look at this and I read it and I think about the program, I have user underscore age is int 
input. So I'm getting something in from the outside world. I have an if statement. The if statement is user age is less than or equal to 18. True, which is coming off the left side of the um, diamond, is going to print 18 or less. False, coming out the right side, is going to print print over 18. Now, you'll notice on this flowchart that I don't have the word else anywhere. And that's because you don't need it on the flowchart. The flowchart has the two different states. True is a state. False is a state. So on the false state, I have something else that's going to happen, and then it's going to go to ending program. And that's because that's what an else looks like on a flowchart. So if Professor Lisa types in 21, and I'm going to go down to my if statement, 21 is not less than or equal to 18, so it's going to evaluate to false. And this is what Python does. It's like, I'm going to ignore everything else. So then I go to run the program again, and I put in 10, and we have user age is less than or equal to 18. That is a true, because 10 is less than or equal to 18, that's a true statement. All that other else stuff goes away, and we print out 18 or less. So, one more decision. We're going to learn about L if now. So, yeah, we, we got a lot more going on here. So, I have a a year, okay? And I want to know how long ago it was. Was it in a galaxy far, far away? Was it in, is it in a distant future? What is it? So I have a variable called year. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. The right-hand side of a single equal sign, I'm going to input an integer that represents a year. So let's go down and look at this because now I have one, two, three, four questions. Sorry, one, two, three questions I'm asking, and then the fourth thing that will happen is because they all all else failed. So I'm going to put in something for year. I'm going to say if year, and year is the test, is greater than 2021, sorry, 2101, it's way in the distant future. L if year is greater than or equal to 2001, 21st century L if year is greater than 1901, 20th century L if long time ago. <clears throat> now, these are mutually exclusive decisions, but they are all related. You will notice that for each of these, we are in fact testing the value of year. Now, we only have the value of, we only have one year in our program. We only have one variable called year. And year cannot have multiple values, multiple different values. Okay, year is an integer and it has a single value. Because of that, and because I am testing year, these are all related. And that's what you have with if, elif, 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 however ever many you have, and else. So that's what makes them related. We are testing the value of this individual variable against different things. Because based on the outcome, we want to do different things. Okay? So that's what we have as an L if. So I could say if year is greater than or equal to 2101. And I could say if year is greater than 2001. I didn't have to use the L if. The advantage of using an L if is that Python's only going to do one. If it Actually, if the year is greater than or equal to 2101, it's going to ignore all these other lines. It's not going to try to actually execute them. It's just going to fall out to the global scope wherever that global scope is. So that is the advantage of using if, elif, and it also allows you to make related decisions. So... Uh, Let's see, I think I said all of that. Yeah, so 1901, only get to that statement if the year is less than 2021 and the year is less than 
sorry, 2101 and the year is less than 2021. And similarly, uh, with the else statement, the year will have to be less than 1901, so it'll have to be 1900 or less. Okay, so let's just talk about me being middle-aged. Maybe not. So I'm going to input a year, and I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Is the year greater than 2021? 2102. Sorry, it should have been 2101. Is the year greater than 2001, or is the year greater than 1901? So what will happen is, each of those diamonds will only get executed, each of those lines of code will only get executed when and if the previous one is not executed. And I don't like this flow chart. So we're going to go out and we're going to look at it in code. So what was that one? That was, uh, sorry, 3.2.4. Okay, let's open up 3.2.4. So here we have an if-else statement. Let me make that bigger. And let's see what happens when we run it. So I'm going to edit my configuration. 3.2.4. Two point four. Okay. So let's debug this because we know now all know how much I like to debugger. So let's put in twenty twenty three and see what happens. So my year is twenty twenty three and I have I have one, two, three different questions associated with that year, excuse me, of twenty twenty three. So the first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna say year is greater than twenty one oh one. Is that true or false? Well, that is false. So guess what? I am not going to to execute line 10. I am now going to stop at line 11. Line 11 is going to ask the next question. Year is greater than or equal to 2001. True or false? Well, 2023 is greater than 2001. So I am going to execute line 12, and you'll see that I am then done. I'm going to now ex ask one more question of year, and I'm done. And that was just actually to show stuff in the global scope. So that is what happens. So you're skipping things that are related, you're telling Python these are all related because we're all looking at year. And the other thing you want to do, why are Ellis statements not indented under their corresponding ifs? That's a good question. Um, because they have to be in the global scope. For this to be executed independently, sorry, for this to be executed when this evaluates to false, it has to be in the global scope. If it's indented, it's not in the global scope, and it will only be executed assuming this is true, which is not what you want to have happen. You can have nested if statements, but you, you cannot have an if and then nest the L if statements, and you don't really want it in this case. Because what you want is you want Python to say, okay, line 9 is false. And then it's going to go and it's going to do the next action in the global scope. So you want the next action in the global scope to be the L if. So that's why you're not indenting them. Does that help? Cool. So now let's talk about Boolean operators. So we've got our keywords, we've got if, elif, and else. Now we're going to talk about our Boolean operators. There are two Boolean operators. There's and and there is or. Now there's a big table in Zybooks that talks about this. 
But basically what you are doing here is you are taking at minimum two different statements and evaluating the output of each statement with either an and or an or. So you're either anding it or you're oring it. And basically says that each statement has to evaluate to true for the entire question to be true. Or says at least one of the questions has to be true for the entire if statement to evaluate to true. So we're able to basically add things together in different ways. And in this slide, what we're seeing is these are just really simple, you know, very, very simple um, statements. Num1 is, is equivalent to 10 and num2 is equivalent to 2. True or false. Well, how do we evaluate that whole statement as true or false? We break it down. Okay. We first look at the first statement. The first part of this statement, the first part of the question is num1 is the same as 10. That means if I look up at the value of num1, it is 10. So that evaluates to true. Then, I'm not going to worry about the operator right now. I want to evaluate the second part of this statement. So the second part of the statement is num2 is the same or is equivalent to the value 2. Well, in this slide, num2 is equivalent to the value 2. If I say and here, then I, I can say true. I have true for the first statement and true for the second statement. So the whole thing becomes true. So now if I look at the second statement with num1 is equivalent to 10 and num2 is less than 2, well, how is that going to evaluate? I'm going to say num1 is the same as 10. That's true. I can see my little num1 is equal to 10 up in the left-hand corner. And then I'm not going to worry about the operator in the middle. I'm going to say num2 is less than 2. Well, that's false because 2 is not less than 2. So I'm going to have a true for the first part of the statement and a false for the second part of the statement. And that means true and false is always false. And there's a logic table in Zybooks that, that shows you all the combinations. The way, the way I most easily remember it is when I am anding something, everything has to be true or it's false. When I am oring something, one has to be true and the whole thing can be true. So if I look down here, at the very bottom of this slide and I say if I look at if num1 is equivalent to 10 and that's true then I say or num2 is less than 2 well that's false but because I've changed that and to an or the actual entire statement will evaluate to true and this can have big implications if you get your ands and your ors wrong, you can come out with all kinds of wrong answers. So let's talk about between. And we're going to go over that. They don't really talk about between well in Zybooks, in my view. Why is that important? Well, it's important because you're going to need it this week. <laughs> um, you're going to need it for your month, uh, for the seasons lab. So what between does is it uses those Boolean operators to decide if some value is between a lower bound and an upper bound. So with your lab, you're going to be talking about the lower bound of a day and the upper bound of a day. And those days aren't always going to be the same because you've got to figure out the seasons. So. If I'm looking at this, and this is also, you see, if, elif, 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 else. So that is what we have here. We have, um, we have age is greater than zero and age is less than four. So what I'm saying is 
If I take zero and I take four, does age sit between them? So that would mean that zero, one, sorry, one, two, and three would evaluate to true for the if statement. And I would say no school. And then I go back and I'm looking at age again. And I'm going to say, okay, is age greater than or equal to four and age less than nine? So is age five, six, seven, or eight? Sorry, four, five, six, seven, or eight, because there's an equal sign there. If age is not, then I move on to the next one. This one is it's greater than or equal to 9 and it's less than 13. Well, in this case, 20 doesn't fall between those. So then I look at age is greater than 13 and age is less than 19. Well, still it doesn't fall between those, so I'm going to fall out and I'm going to basically say to infinity and beyond. This, this is here because you have to do that kind of a calculation when you're dealing with the season's lab. Okay, so, and uh, we can go back and look at some of these. I'm definitely going to go and look at the floor in Zybooks. This has to do with the lab that you are, um, for the coin counting. Can't remember the number. I think it's 2.13. But we'll look at that in a minute. So this is how you're structuring complex questions because that's what's really going on here. So if I have some number and I want to know the number of hundreds in it and I want to know the number of tens in it, how do I do that? Well, first of all, you have to use the floor operator. This does not work if you do not use the floor operator. If you use the modular operator in that lab, you are not going to get the right answers. So what I'm doing here is I'm doing a calculation up at the top. I'm going to start with a number of 223. I'm going to say 223 floor 100. And what that's going to do is it's going to give me the number of times 100 goes into 223 as a whole number only. So in this case, it's going to be 2. And then I have the calculation has to be num equal num mine hundreds times 10. So in this case, it's going to be 223 minus 200 is going to give me my, no, my new number. And my new number is going to be, my, the number of tens that I have is going to be num floor 10. In this case, that's going to be 2. So I'm going to have 200s and 2 tens. But then the, the tricky part, the new part comes in when we're having to deal with the if and elif statements. So what I have to do is I have to have a series of ELIF statements associated with each individual value that I'm looking at. So in this case, I'm looking at hundreds and I'm looking at tens. So I say if hundreds is equivalent to zero, then I'm going to print I don't have any hundreds. Else if hundreds is greater than one, then I'm going to have the number of hundreds is, and I have to, you know, um, make sure it's plural, and then else there aren't any hundreds. And then I'm going to do the same thing for 10. So this is in between, but it is a series of if, elif, else statements associated with each of the different numbers that you're dealing with. And here is the one for 10s. So I'm going to go, yes. Okay. Why are if, okay. So do the statements need to be in parentheses? No. Per, statements do not need to be in parentheses, unlike languages like Java. Uh, that is because we have the colon. That colon tells you when to stop. That colon is, is the question mark for Python. So you don't have to have, in fact, um, some, some of the Python compilers won't let you have them. Some will, uh, but you don't need them. Is Boolean used in scripting as we would in writing? 
Could you expand on that a little bit? I'm not sure that I understand the question. So if you can expand on that a little bit, I'm going to keep going. And I want to do the floor one. Where's floor? There's floor. So this is just an example that is somewhat like what you're going to be doing for your program. It's certainly not the whole thing. So if I look at floor, okay, where's floor? Because I can't spell, obviously. Between compound, compound, compound floor. Okay. So what I have here is, and I, I didn't bother doing the input on this. Can you go over the nested LS statements? Yes, I will. And in fact, we're going to do them right now. So I have, my money is 50. I have, I don't know why I said money is 50. Where is money even in here? Okay. Okay. So my, I have money is 50. And then I just, I've, in, rather than using uh, an integer, I've said 100 and quarter. And sometimes that's kind of just for also people to see what the value is. So I have my money. And I want to find out how many, time, how many dollars and how many quarters I have. So my dollars is going to be the amount of money I have using the floor operator and then 100. And that's going to give me the number of dollars. And then I'm going to have I'm going to create a new amount, and the amount is going to be money minus dollars times a hundred. And then I'm going to create get my quarters by amount floor quarter. And then I'm going to have the number of quarters. And then I'm going to go into my if, else, and else statements. These are basically going to be, if I, ha if I have dollars, then I'm going to print dollars, and I'm going to either print dollar or dollars. And then if I have quarters, and you'll notice that's not an LF. These two are not related. They are completely independent. While as these two are completely related. So let's run through this a bit. Okay, we'll do this. So, I'm not, I don't need to worry about the console because I'm not doing any input at this point. So, I've got, my money is 50. The dollars that I get is going to be dollar, is going to be money, um, floor 100, and it's going to be zero, and that's okay. So, now I want to do the number of quarters and the number of quarters is two. So now I'm going to talk about dollars. Dollars, if dollars is greater than zero, true or false? Well, that's false. So now I'm going to go to quarters. And I stop here because quarters and dollars don't have anything to do with each other. So this is the next statement in the global scope. Lines 16 through 20, we're in the local scope of the if statement on line 15. They didn't get executed because there are no dollars. So now I have quarters. So I'm going to print the number of quarters. And I'm going to end it with a space. And I have to do this for the lab. So then I'm going to say if the number of quarters is a, is one, then I'm going to print the singular quarter. Otherwise, if it's greater than one, I'm going to print um, the plural of quarters. So in this case, I will print the plural of quarters. So now let's just change this. We're gonna we're gonna completely change this up by changing the amount of money. So I'm going to say 11.42. And I'm going to debug it because we all know I like the debugger. So now my money is 11.42. So 
if I look at the number of dollars, I'm now going to have $11. And then if I look at the quarters, I'm going to have a single quarter. So I've just, just by changing that one value, things are going to happen differently in this program. So dollars is greater than zero, true or false. The answer is true, so I will now step into line 16. I am in the local scope of dollars greater than zero. So I'm going to print the dollars, okay? And now I have my nested if and else statement. So now I'm going to say dollars is, is, is equivalent to one. That's false. And by the way, a nice little thing here with PyCharm, if I hold my mouse over the operator, PyCharm will tell me what that individual statement evalu evaluates to. And then, well, and that's going to be false. So then I'm going to go down to and print dollars. Quarters, is quarters greater than one? True. So I'm going to go print quarters. I have one quarter. And because I only have one quarter, I'm going to print the word quarter. So it's going to be $11 and one quarter. So because we're starting to run really low on time, um, let me see what else I have with nested if. if I have something more complex. Okay, so do we look at Boolean as if we would when doing a research paper for engineering or is it completely different in scripting? Um, it's not completely different. Boolean has two values, true or false. So that's what a Boolean is. And in scripting, that's it. You just have true or false. So if from an engineering perspective, you have a Boolean, and it's either true or false, then it's the same. Otherwise, then it's different. But that's all it is. A Boolean is either true or false. So let me see if I have something with more nested if statements. Uh Okay, so this one is 3.82, and we're dealing with a nested if statement, and we're looking at temperatures. So um, I actually don't like this one because I don't like the way they did that. Hmm. I may have to do that one. I don't think I have any with... That one doesn't have any nested if. Uh, do I have a nested? I have a nested. Okay, here's the nested one that I created. So basically what we have is, this is also interesting because it's kind of related to what you're going to be doing with your game. Um, so basically what we have here is I'm going to enter one of north, south, east, or west. And then dependent on the direction, I'm going to print something else out. And if I'm north, I get, I've got to go through and evaluate all of these. So lines 5 through 11 will only happen when I type the word north. Now, additionally, line 6 is going to ask for an amount or a distance. So if my distance is greater than 10, then I'm going to say it's a long way if um, the amount is greater than 5, you know, you won't freeze right away, and otherwise it's going to say go south. So that, and then at the very end it's going to print end. So let's go and talk through this a bit. So, whoops, wait a minute, that's not what I wanted to do wanted to do this and go to nested if I can find it. I hate the fact that this thing doesn't automatically come up. 
alphabetically. So we're on nested. Let me close some of these windows. Okay. And I'm just going to start the debugger. Stop and rerun. Okay. So basically, let's start by printing north. So I type in north. I'm going to step over. I'm going to go to my frames and variables. So my value for direction is north. So I am now executing line 5, and I'm going to say enter a distance. So my distance is going to be 42. And 42 is greater than 10, true or false. That's false. Sorry, true. So I'm going to say it's a long way and it's going to be cold. Now, what's going to happen? Well, am I going to go to line 12 and evaluate line 12? Or am I going to go to line 21? Because these are L if statements, and these will only get executed when line 4 evaluates to false, I'm going to fall out to line 21 because line 4 has already evaluated to true. So I'm going to step over and I'm going to say the end. So that is what happens when you have a nested if statement. You're essentially running a small mini program inside that if statement. And those branches can have something to do with the um, outer if statement or not. In this case, when I go north, somebody's going to have to enter the distance because it's going to be cold and then I'm going to tell them what's going to happen. So that is, that's how an if nested if works. And you can have multiple nests. You don't have to just have one level of nested if. You can have nested if after nested if after nested if. If you get more than three or four deep, you probably want to restructure your data. But that is an example of a nested if statement. Does that... Um, kind of answer your question, Greg. And um, yes, I can show the flow charts for the season lab, but what I am going to do is I'm going to go, um, okay, I'm glad. I'm going to go over the pseudocode for it, and then if need be, I will go out and I'll open up the flow chart for it as well, because actually there is too much of it to... Um, to go through on the flowchart, but we can get the whole thing in on the slides for um, the pseudocode. So this was just the flowchart that I was doing for the the um, the hundreds and the tens, but I'm probably not going to do that. Where am I? But I am going to start on the pseudocode. And if the pseudocode doesn't work this week, work for you guys this week, let me know and I will bring up the flowcharts. Um, that is up to you. I like the debugger. I work every day and I usually have the debugger up and running because that's what makes sense to me. And especially if I've got some complex algorithms and something's not behaving quite the way I think it is, I want to run it through with different data and observe exactly what's happening so I can find my logic error because that's what that is. It's a logic error. So here we have lab 3.11 and it's write a program whose inputs are three integers and whose output is the smallest of the three integers. And this is a prime use of the word and of the Boolean operator AND. And this is pseudocode. So you're going to have to turn in pseudocode and flowcharts. And so it's time to start talking about pseudocode because a lot of people like it. Pseudocode is basically a way of writing a program that's language agnostic, showing all of the logic associated with it um, with without actually writing it in a programming language. And some people think that doesn't make any sense, 
But when you are starting to deal with very large algorithms, um, sometimes writing it out and not worrying about the nuances of a given language can help you. Um, it, it can help you work through the logic. So, the first thing I'm going to do on this program is it's going to take three inputs: first, second, and third. And then I'm going to have an if, an elif, and an else statement. The if statement is going to say, is the first number, is first, less than or equal to second, and is first less than or equal to third? So if first is less than or equal to second, and that evaluates to true, and first is less than or equal to third, and that evaluates to true, then first is the smallest number. If that evaluates to false, we then go to the ELIF statement, which is going to check second, and it's going to check second against first, and second against third. If second is less than first, and second is less than or equal to third, then second is the largest number. Otherwise, the third has to be the largest number. So this is a relatively small program but it requires the understanding of Boolean operators. Now, this is the seasons one, and it is the biggest program you will, you will have written up to this point. Um, and this has to be done in this order. I have students who've tried to shorten this, and it doesn't quite work. So we're going to input a month, and we're going to input a day. And what we want back from that is the season. And seasons aren't necessarily aligned with months and with, with the with you know months from zero to one. So a season can cut a month in half. So what we're first going to do is we're first going to check the month. And even if we are only using a single if statement to do all the checking, we always want to check the month first. Because that's the, that, that is the easiest way for Python to decide whether to skip that or not. Because we're going to have months that are going to have 0 to 29, 28, 29, 30, and 31. But what we want is we want to make it, we want the biggest differentiator first. And the biggest differentiator we have is the month. So if I put in January, the first thing it's going to say is month equals January. True. So I'm then going to go on and look at the rest of this stuff. So if month doesn't equal January, Python's just going to fall out. It's going to look at February. Then February, January and February are pretty easy because they don't split. The, the season doesn't split the month. When the season splits the month, it becomes more complex. So for the month of March, I can either be in winter or spring. How do I tell the difference between winter or spring when it's March? I tell it based on the day. If the day that the user input is greater than zero, and yes, we do have to check that it's greater than zero, because Zybooks might put in a negative 10. If it's greater than zero and less than or equal to 19, I'm at winter. LF, the day is greater than 19 and less than 31, I'm in spring. Otherwise, it's invalid. And that's important because Python's going to give you negative 42. It's going to give you the month of um, Halloween. And I'm not saying it's going to put in October. It's going to put in a word. It's going to put in the word yellow for the month. And it expects you to be able to say that's an invalid entry. And the way you do that is, so if it put in yellow for month, you want it to get and to evaluate to negative to all these statements and then eventually um, have an, an, a final else This is it's invalid. Or maybe it's going to put in the month of October and the day of 177. That's going to also fall to invalid. Well, actually, that'll fall to the invalid for the month of October. So that's what you have to do here. 
and it does it's complex but they follow a pattern and if you can follow the pattern here it's actually a little simpler months that are not split by a season are a single one liner and they all have ands so they're going to have the month and they're going to check the lower bound and you're going to check the upper bound months that split where the season splits the months you're going to first determine that it's that month so you're going to have a statement that's looking just for the month and then inside that you're going to have an if an elif and an else the if is going to check the the lower and upper bounds for one season the elif is going to check the lower and upper bounds for the next season and the else is going to say sorry it's invalid you put in, you know, minus 100 for the day. So that is what you want to do for 3.12. 3.13 is very much like that numbers one that we did with the floor operator. Somebody's going to put in a value. The first thing you're going to check it for is that it is um, – greater than or equal to zero so if it's less than or equal to zero you're going to output no change and be done with it otherwise you're going to go and you're going to do a series of calculations dollars quarters dimes nickels and pennies so you're going to get that whole calculation done then you're going to go in and you're going to put in if statements associated with how you want it to look when it comes out because you're not having to worry about an if statement while you're doing the calculation. You are having to deal with the if statement, though, for the output. So if you have dollars, then you're going to determine whether it's the you know, dollar or dollars. The same thing with quarter. You're, if you've got quarters, you're going to say, do I have quarters or a single quarter, dimes, nickels, pennies, they all follow that same pattern. So once you get dollars, you've basically got um, the pattern for quarters. And these, notice, are if statements. They're not L if. So it's if num dollars, if num quarters, you know, if number of dimes. Those are not, those are different tests. You're not, you don't have any related tests here when it comes to the actual number of quarters, nickels, dimes, pennies, dollars. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Yes, there is. Hey, you're welcome to try it. Um, my suggestion would be is that you get the, the lab done successfully without dealing with lists or dictionaries, um, and then maybe go try it later because your professor might take off, even if you're trying things that are outside the scope of the module, you probably still want to just get the points for that and then go try it. But yeah, there would definitely be a way to do this um, with... Uh, a dictionary and and list you could do this yeah probably be a dictionary with some lists in it um, well for what students have in module three that's the right way to do it if you want to stretch and use lists and dictionaries, there are more efficient ways to do it. There are more data-driven ways to do it where you're writing considerably less code. But for what we have now, that's the proper logic. And by the way, I'm done lecturing. Does anybody want to uh, ask any questions? I know we ran over, and I apologize. There's just so much in this module to do. Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, everybody have a good weekend. I should have this up tomorrow. Talk to you later.